So, uh, happy Wednesday night, everybody. Uh, we are here on Google Hangouts, um, and we are talking with a good friend of mine and the UDL evangelist. Um, in fact, the guy who I, I stole that phrasing from, uh, Kit Hard, um, uh, talking about designing uh, for classroom culture and designing um, environments and what that looks like as we start the beginning of the year. Um, also on the line, um, we'll go around and uh, Starting with Eric, you can just kind of introduce yourself real quick. Or Kim, you can jump in. That's cool. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Kim Shovelbein from Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. I'm a universal design for learning coach for our district. So I'm actually probably more coordinator, I guess. Um, so I'm just really excited to share what we've been experiencing as well as learn from you wonderful people and all of our uh, audience that's uh, listening in. And then uh, we got Ron uh, Rogers on online too. Ron, why don't you uh, why don't you give us a little uh, quick bio? Okay, I'm Ron Rogers, and I'm from Ohio. Of course, you know here in Ohio we all love the Buckeyes. <laughs> so, you know, and I work for Ocali, highest center for autism and low incidence, and well, Kit and I and all of us we welcome everybody to the UDL chat. Nine o'clock after we're done here. That's it. That's the plug. I love it. Um, <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Eric. You're on. So I'm Eric Moore. I'm uh, working with the UDL I run right now as an intern. I'm also a PhD candidate at University of Tennessee. Um, basically, my my interest is focusing on pre-service teacher uh, development and especially in tr um, equipping them to use UDL in their future classrooms. So. Um, I'm working on some solutions right now. Normally with these kinds of things I have a transcription team because I'm hard of hearing and um, this this electronic format is actually quite a bit more difficult for me. Um, I don't have that available right now so I'm trying to call in um, with some text-based features and still working on it. Um, so, so I'm sorry I'm not very active right now but um, it's good to meet you all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen real quick and we'll get through some of the uh, some of the UDL IRN stuff, um, and then uh, the man's going to take over the mic. <clears throat> so again, welcome everybody uh, to our well, our first UDL IRN Google Hangout of the year, um, but our second one overall. The first one we did, uh, you can find on our archives. Um, it's taking a minute to load up, uh, and then. Uh, down here you can see, uh, join us over at udlirn.org, which is an amazing website um, full of great research uh, and, and uh, great tools uh, for everybody to use and take a look at. The protocol that we're going to use, the, the Hangout lasts for about an hour, um, and the first 20 of that is really identifying the problem. And so in this case, uh, Kit's going to lay it out for us and uh, say what he sees um, as a problem. Um, around designing for culture and designing uh, using UDL to design for culture and design for environments. Um, the second section of that 20, 20, 20 protocol is the potential so solutions where Kit and, and, and the rest of us will kind of lay out what we think are um, solutions that we're seeing or what we've seen work. Um, and then the final portion of that is more open conversation. So in order for that to happen, it's incredibly important that you guys are following us, uh, follow along in the conversation uh, on on Twitter, um, and so we got some people that are managing the the, the Twitter lines right now. In fact, uh, UDL Center just uh, just sent us a, a, a tweet, so um, saying join the uh, join the chat directly after this. I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. UDL Center, um, but uh, using the hashtag UDLIRN, please uh, join in on the conversation and, and tell us what you're seeing out there in the field as well. Um, <clears throat> and then. You can follow us on YouTube. Here's the YouTube uh, uh, link very quickly, and it's also in our chat notes. Um, or you can follow us on Google Plus because it's streaming there as well. I got to make a plug for the 2016 UDL IRN Summit. It's coming March 16th and 17th. It is not a place you want to miss. Am I right, Kim? It was pretty wonderful. I would that, recommend it. <laughs> That's it. There you go. She says it was pretty <laughs> wonderful. You want to be there. This year it's in Towson University in Maryland. Um, we're still calling for proposals now, so get in there, uh, tell us what you want to talk about, and uh, share some of your great implementation. And finally, 
but not by any means least. Do not forget to join us over in UDL chat tonight where my man Ron Rogers and myself will be moderating, um, uh, talking about uh, our continuing this conversation and talking about how um, <clears throat> our PLNs and, and variability exists and all sorts of really great, interesting stuff. There will be another plug for this at the end of this. So with that, let me introduce the man himself as I'm stopping Sharon and it's going back to my picture. Uh, my, my good friend, Kid Hard. Um, can I call you my good friend, Kid Hard? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, even better. Uh, so I'm trying to exit out of it. I'm trying to get back to my picture. <clears throat> now, Kid has had many positions um, where he's done great, great things. Currently, he's working over in Michigan. Uh, he's working in Port Huron, and you are this, are you the coordinator or supervisor? Uh, I guess of, they, they, they're giving me supervisor right now. <laughs> Look at that. Look at my man stepping up. Uh, he's a supervisor of uh, professional learning and what else? Instructional technology. Instructional technology and innovation and everything that's good uh, with Port Huron. Is that, am I right? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and uh, so um, I first met Kit. I'm just going to drop this real quick. I first met Kit actually at a McCall, um, uh, which is our local like uh, ISTE affiliate. And he was giving this great demonstration on how to use context and how to use um, uh, Google Lit Trips and lots of cool things. And I, I, the one thing that sticks out to me, brother, is uh, this wonderful mane of hair that you have. Your brilliant, your brilliant speaking style, and uh, you had on this amazing vest, brother. Um, and so I was like, I need to chat with that dude. So uh, I went up there and introduced myself, and um, uh, he he blew me off, of course. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, he said, who is this really strange, uh, furry-looking muppet? Um, that, that's coming up and talking to me, and then I found him later uh, as we started working through UDL. And ever since then, I just I love the man's words. So when the when the time came to ask somebody about um, joyful learning and, and the and the power of of using UDL to design culture and environment, Kit was was the only choice for me, uh, and the only choice for UDL IRN. So without further ado, I'm done talking and I'm done being the MC. I'm going to turn it over to my man Kit. Kit, take it away, brother. All right. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that introduction. And uh, yeah, I remember uh, back at that McCall conference when we first kind of connected. And it's uh, it's awesome that uh, Universal Design for Learning is kind of still alive and well here in Michigan. Uh, even though I'm technically actually over in Ohio, or not Ohio. Sorry, Ron. Ontario right now. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so that I can. Uh, start showing some of the slides that I've got for this evening and hopefully you're able to see what I've got on my screen. Give me a whoop whoop if you are seeing my presentation. Yeah, it looks wonderful. I got you. All right. Great. So uh, I'll just say a couple quick things about myself before I kind of dig into this and uh, one being that uh, I live in Ontario, but I work in Michigan, so I get to drive across the border uh, every day from Canada to the United States, which has added some interesting perspectives to my life. Um, I, I really have enjoyed uh, kind of that cross-cultural experience, even though there's a lot of similarities between the countries, um, but it's been a really uh, remarkable uh, time in my life. I grew up out in Wyoming and went to school in Montana, so I'm kind of a Westerner that has found himself uh, <laughs> in uh, Canada, and my accent's all messed up, and I say A a lot, um, but I married a Canadian. And there's a picture of my family down here that hopefully you can see. And we had a wonderful trip this summer to Quebec. And my kids are both in a French immersion program over here, which is a real uh, great thing for them. And we got to experience that French culture uh, in Quebec. And that uh, was just something that has really kind of informed my current thinking right now, too. I, I, I really found that experience uh, amazing. So I wanted to share that with all of you. And then uh, this picture here of me uh, was taken really recently. So I've just taken this new job uh, with Port Huron Schools as a technology integration supervisor. So I spend a lot of time working with teachers, helping them to use technology in the most effective ways. And I thought that this picture of me was somewhat 
symbolic. I feel that my universal design for learning role is still a little bit hidden. Um, it, it's kind of under the radar, and so the fact that you can't quite make me out here, I'm, I'm sort of this shadowy figure <laughs> moving across the, through the room, so I, I'm, I'm embedding universal design for learning in uh, uh, hopefully uh, effective ways, but not overt ways yet with my district because I'm still new there, but it's my hope to uh, bring universal design for learning to the forefront of the work that I do with technology integration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to share that. So we'll kind of get into this this 2020 format. I will do my best not to completely blow it up, but I uh, I do have some some kind of guiding questions that I'm hoping folks will uh, resonate around and be able to respond to um, that sort of present that problem to us. Um, so I'll start with this idea of what do our learning spaces say about our educational values and beliefs? And I want to clarify, when I'm talking about learning spaces, I don't necessarily just mean bricks and mortar and tables and chairs, lighting. I, I also really want us to dig deeper into that um, social emotional piece, the, the environment and the culture that we create, and that that all is part of our learning spaces and how we communicate to our students and ourselves and our community about our educational values and beliefs. So I'm hoping that you'll all, I, I'm hoping also not to just be this talking head. So I'm going to uh, tell you a little storytelling as I go through these um, with these pictures that I have and then at any point I'm going to kind of pause and see if uh, my friends here who are live with me want to chime in and maybe kind of uh, tap on over into the Twitter chat to see what uh, folks are saying. So I'll tell you just a little story. This goes back to my history. The majority of my universal design for learning sort of uh, gestation took place in this building that you see here. Um, spent a lot of time in this classroom. And it was a high school for ninth and 10th grade students who were essentially disengaged from the educational process. They no longer saw the value in school, and they were on a trajectory of leaving school too soon, leaving the learning process too soon. And we were tasked with finding ways to re-engage them and to use cross-curricular um, planning, to use technology, to use project-based learning, and to use whatever else we kind of individually brought in our toolbox uh, to the table. Um, so looking at this picture and with the prompt of what does this say about our educational values and beliefs, I don't want the caution tape to uh, get read in too heavily there. I, uh, although I think sometimes we have kind of put up emotional caution tape around our buildings and around our classrooms. So that's something to think about in terms of the problem and what we're looking to do in um, you know, eliminating barriers and creating um, inviting spaces for learning. But the reason that there's caution tape up in this picture is because we were in the midst of a forensics project-based learning uh, lesson. It was uh, our whole building became transformed by this crime scene. Uh, the principal was murdered, not literally, but it was, uh, it, it, we had video um, testimonies from suspects. We had uh, DNA sampling kits that students were engaging around. Um, the classrooms were uh, essentially dismantled. The, there you know, wasn't desks in a row for, for several weeks. It, the, this classroom existed as a crime scene and remained preserved uh, during that time. And, and so I share that as um, uh, not so much a solution, but just a, an inspiration around what that might have been communicating um, at that time. So I'll pause for a second because I do see that there's even uh, a question, um, or not so much a question, but maybe also trying to kind of invite others in about what do our learning spaces communicate. So I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to our group now for a moment. Kid, I, I love this uh, this analogy that you put out there um, where you say, you know, 
uh, we put up some caution tape, and that you know that was part of part of the lesson. But um, when you started talking about this idea that we we put up um, caution tape around our classrooms in different ways, I I find that to be um, I find that to be a, a, a profound statement um, because I, I really really think that that um, that what you're really stating is that you know because we have because we're lacking in designing variability. Um, or we're not taking that always into consideration. We're really, we're really telling our students before they even step in that this may not be the place for you. Yeah. Um, and and when I think about it in that term, um, I don't think there's a teacher out there that does that intentionally. Um, right. So so I guess right. a lot of my question comes around the idea of how how is it possible for us to always stay kind of almost like hyper vigilant about that idea of design? Yeah. It's a good question. So, is there are you, anybody got any thoughts out there? Um, also, I want to go back and I want to say that uh, Kim Coy uh, or at Coy underscore Kimberly is um, out there pushing uh, and 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 contributing to the chat on Twitter. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, she hasn't she hasn't hit me with a question yet, but she's uh, you know she's. She's out there. She's active. I'm happy to see her. She's my girl, of course. Um, and she, she reiterates the question: like, what, what do the, what do our learning spaces really say about us? And and Kit, you you highlighted yourself. They may say caution. So yeah. um, how do we get around that? How do we move around that? Right. I'll turn it over. So this is just another uh, picture from that school that I worked at, and again, um, thinking a little bit beyond just the spaces of uh, these schools and what the culture we're creating. Um, what I saw happening in this particular building was we were trying to invite students into that learning process and to make them have ownership over the, uh, the, the space and what it meant to learn there. So these students had designed a speedway for balloon cars that were going to be part of both a science and math um, lesson. And uh, the creation of the speedway, the design of the cars, the um, you know kind of engagement around the competition and really sort of in being very tangible with this math and science learning were, were some of the things that um, we were tasked with doing and, and, and hoping to accomplish. Um, at the same time, when I look and I knew these students, I know that even with this and even with what we saw before in the picture, we weren't always successful in having our learning environment say to these students, we welcome you, we honor where you are in your learning process, and we're here to all work together in that. So I think that I want to widen that problem again. Even if you do have what I thought was a pretty amazing learning space that we had been very intentional in the design of, what does it say to us if our learning space still isn't communicating that. Even when you think you're doing your very best work. This is another uh, picture uh, where I, what, I, what I think is interesting about this is that we were really um, active in using the whole building not just the interior spaces of the building. And just as a background to this picture, we, we turned the side of the building into uh, essentially our X and Y axis. Mm -hmm. And we created this trebuchet. Students brought in personal objects from home. So some people brought fruits and bananas, and some people brought little stuffed animals. And they got to launch whatever they wanted to launch on the trebuchet. And we recorded each launch with a video camera and then everyone got their own individual video file to um, 
chart out the trajectory of their launch as part of a way of um, looking at linear equations or uh, parabolas and some algebraic thinking and um, to give them some authentic data that was their own uh, to work with. So um, I share that again as just there was a lot of design and thinking behind this and around creating um, voice and choice and personalizing, um, challenging mathematical concepts. And it was an attempt at addressing that question of um, how the physical environment and also the, the academic environment were meant to be engaging. And yet, when I look, you know, it's not all smiles and fun. There's still, uh, there's still challenges to that. So before I move into what I see as kind of another prompt to that question, I, I'll open it up again to the group and see if there's any thoughts. Um, so, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kim. Oh, if I, I was just going to speak to, um, so as a part of, I mentioned earlier, we have uh, 30 new pilots going through this year. And as a part of uh, implementing U UDL, we've kind of developed this four pillar approach and one of the pillars is looking at like the overall classroom environment including the physical spaces so we've actually um, as a part of this pilot have um, introduced like some flexible furniture and um, in fact in these classrooms there are desks for some kids who may still need those because that's how some kids do stay engaged <laughs> they need that structure of a desk but we have a genius bars that we built along the side windows for the natural light and just some flexible uh, furniture, um, just to promote that more um, collaborative community. Um, and we've seen like students do feel more comfortable, and the room uh, changes with that activity depending on if they're doing group work or if they're doing more of like a mini lesson kind of thing. Um, so the room kind of changes with what um, with with the learners and what they need for particular. Um, subjects if that makes sense um, and students are um, encouraged to find the places where they can work at their best um, and giving them in that like empowerment has been like really successful students that maybe would have felt the need to leave the classroom before to kind of you know find their own space they're able to find you know a place near the genius bar where suddenly they're um, more comfortable staying within the classroom and, and that kind of thing um, so um, that's a kind of a work in progress with us too, but we figure as we move forward with UDL implementation to make more flexible in room environments um, the kind of um, that are conducive to the learner variability <laughs> that we um, that we have in our, in our classroom as well. You know, I think that there's a, a, a really interesting point that that Kim, you you are highlighting and Kit that you are presenting. Um, and it's this idea that if, if our environmental space um, is conducive, so I love this idea of building genius bars in classrooms and, and really toying with the uh, physical environment, allowing students to really have some design uh, principles in that because they're designers and they're end users of their own design. But um, working with that um, starts to build that culture of collaboration, which is really a culture that is being fostered um, and, and is it starts to be more accepting of variability. Mm -hmm. And Kit, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but but the spaces that you're showing us, um, and really it seems that you're talking about really non-traditional classrooms and classrooms where um, we're really focused on projects and we're very focused on uh, uh, the journey towards the project. Um, and as we do that, as we put that non-traditional, uh, non-bureaucratically driven kind of education forward, um, are we are we allowing is, is that in and, in and of itself what fosters this um, this idea of taking down the caution tape I'm going to go back to it because I love it so much taking down the caution tape around our classrooms and saying hey all students can can uh, exist here uh, I'm going to leave that as a question for you guys to answer first I got to give a shout out to my uh, to my girl uh, Koi underscore Kim on Twitter um, she's got her whole crew from Fresno uh, her her soon to be teachers watching us so. You know, a shout out to them. Shout a uh, UDL shout out to them. So I'm with that. I'm going to turn it back over to everybody, to kind of chat. Well, I think 
what Kimberly was saying, and even that with uh, with both Kimberleys, um, this idea uh, we've got some pre-service teachers that may be watching this, and Eric working with pre-service teachers. My question is: is even though we've designed these spaces maybe with some intentionality, what I also experienced, and maybe is part of the problem, is that teachers coming into these spaces almost need a, to be retrained in what it yes, is to teach in those spaces. Go ahead and say it. I was really, de, uh, deinstitutionalized? <laughs> yes, because one of the rooms in this building that I worked in had lots of windows, had that fishbowl um, piece, was meant to be uh, a very transparent type of classroom. And almost every teacher that ever um, was asked to teach in there um, could, felt compelled to cover those windows with posters and paper and there was very little that could be done to convince them otherwise and that there is a, a value in that transparency and so while we worked through some of the the pieces of this space is meant to be different and used differently and and the students were very open to it in a lot of ways changing instructional practice it, it, it's like changing the learning environment inside too or the the teaching environment inside of us as well well I think the focus is you know it has to be more student uh, oriented rather you know than um, the teacher being like that traditional stand up in front of the class you're right it is a mind shift um, a lot of our teachers have even um, they've removed their desks completely so that it completely wow. looks like it's student centered when you walk in or if they have a desk it's a smaller one like tucked in the corner and and that just speaks volumes too about like what where the focus is uh, when you enter those classrooms but you're right so, it is a mind change yeah so Kim and, and, and Kit um, as you were talking about these and and I love the idea of uh, getting rid of um, the teacher desk and, and decentralizing um, instruction. Um, in these non-traditional classrooms, environmentally non-traditional classrooms that you're talking about, is it a conscious choice that comes from, from the teacher as they get more and more involved in UDL principles, or is it something that's uh, a mandate that starts to be handed? Or, or does it create its own norms amongst the teaching culture? Um, what, are, what have you guys kind of experienced in those areas? Well, I've seen it come um, from both ways, actually. I think you'll um, hear some teachers talk about how, um, you know, we have like a number of bodies in the classroom, and so they just all of a sudden, they're, when they look at their space and how to use it more uh, productively, they're like, do I really need this big honking desk, <laughs> you know, in the room? Um, and we've even, you know, our teachers, as they get into m learning more about UDL and learner variability, like they're very, um, strategic even what they're putting on their walls now like in, in fact we say to them wait before you put something on your wall you need to be able to answer the question like is this a want <laughs> um, or is this a, something I need for instruction because um, we want just those classrooms to be very um, you know stimulating but not too over stimulating for certain you know things that fall within that variability range the edges I like. I, I think those points. You know, it is that combination of mandated pieces help to maybe initiate or create that first momentum. But I think it's experiencing those UDL principles firsthand as teachers take on some of those pieces and start to own and identify some of the ways that they're designing the learning environment. Both and both physically and emotionally, design and and academically, as they start to take ownership over and identifying it against those universal design for learning principles, and seeing how it's also translating to a classroom culture that is honoring variability, then that's where that that momentum really can start to take off. Um, so ultimately, it does have to be a, a an owned piece by. And um, beyond that, too, like when, when they do take away their teachers, that's like something that a lot of our teams have done is establish another area within the building that they can come together as a collaborative team and plan around. 
the variability that exists in your classroom. So they still have that collaborative, um, or even more so, because they've developed a space where um, where their focus is more around, you know, planning um, for their variability too. So just wanted to bring that point out as well. Like they may be giving up their desk in their classroom, but they've created another space where they're able to be more uh, collaborative. So I, I think what you're saying is that th there's this move, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm trying to paraphrase it. There's this move from what we believe to be traditional teaching, standing up, um, kind of delivering, you know, the learning, all oh, right, <laughs> to this idea of really we are designers, and we're designing not only the space that we exist in, the space that our students exist in, but the but that then forces this this. Um, collaborative sense that, that starts mm -hmm. happening. Is, am, am I summarizing that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that concept, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna also throw it um, back to Twitter because uh, at, Ki at Koi uh, underscore Kim uh, Kimberly is uh, asking the question uh, to Kit and everybody else: How can new teachers um, step out and affect change to their environments? And I think that's mm -hmm. that's huge. Like, you know, how are you gonna feel safe doing that? Right. And I guess that kind of transitions into, and, and Mitch asks for practical advice about that, you know, first year elementary teachers utilizing classroom space in non-traditional ways, what would that look like? And I know most of my pictures are going to be um, kind of at that secondary level, although I spend a lot of time in elementary now. Um, and, and what I'll just share quickly in terms of my slides and maybe lead into that conversation about what can, what are some practical things. It's the beginning of the year. and teachers around the country are introducing the culture of their classroom in a lot of interesting and creative ways and this is a time to to really uh, to step out and affect the change of environment uh, as, a, as a new teacher or as an elementary teacher so finding those activities and strategies I, I'm seeing a lot in my own building uh, right now in Port Huron where where we're spending time um, asking students to be designers of the norms and visions and 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 expectations of the classroom, mm -hmm. rather than the teachers being the the sole source of that information. And I'll just say with these pictures, this actually was at the end of the year, but it could have been at the beginning of the year in terms of just finding ways to let students. <sighs> soar really and have have very tangible ways to to be part of that learning environment we I would set up at our our school I would just plant myself at the very front of the building as students would come in in the morning and I would ask them all sorts of different questions I used digital tools as my vehicle but it was really about learning I wanted to know as much as I could about our students and I wanted our teachers in the building to also have that insight and um, but in the process of using these sort of social emotional who are you tell me about yourself what are your goals what are your dreams we were also facilitating the use of these same tools for academic content mm -hmm. and it didn't interfere with our classroom time we, we I, it was sort of a soft introduction to the technology um, which was part of what I was tasked to do, but without it interfering with the 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 academic needs of the classroom time, and then we also um, let students in our building have a real say in the actual space of the building, and to let so this is a student designing a landscaping project for our building because we had very little landscaping. Uh, when this building was designed and we wanted students to have a hand in that and we tried to incorporate you know different math pre, uh, principles science principles and a lot of language arts into uh, that project but building culture in that first mm -hmm. uh, part of the school year it, it is is to invite students into saying this is your space mm -hmm. and place for learning and we're a uh, community and so it we can create that community with no academic pieces, but we also found ways to make it part of how we learn, what we need to learn. Absolutely. We've, um, we've been doing a lot of the same things uh, with our pilots during the first few weeks. Um, 
they've really been concentrating on building that classroom community and culture. Um, we followed Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Kate's work um, with um, the social and emotional learning piece. So we've really been tapping into, you know, um, really um, diving into kids. Um, you know, what what are your um, intelligences that that you can offer to this classroom? Um, so that you can feel more, uh, you know, like a contributing citizen, that you are, you are needed, and you are an important and integral uh, part of this community. So I totally agree. We've been spending a ton of time on uh, community building and, and just classroom culture, and I think it'll pay off uh, academically <laughs> later because the kids will feel more um, just a part of that community. And it'll be a safe and comfortable place to learn. A safe place to make mistakes and learn from them. Um, we try to, you know, instill that kind of culture within our classroom as well. You know, that's um, that brings up a, a, an interesting point too. Um, so, on the Twitter feed, um, <clears throat> there have been some questions, and I threw out uh, these two really cool places: the Adaptive Design Lab. Um, they build some really, really sweet stuff um, out of cardboard. Um, whether it be partitions or, um, you know, slant boards or, um, you know, pizza box desks or, or chairs, um, which is a really low cost way of, of changing your seating um, from materials that are already there. And more importantly, uh, it can be done by students. Um, so they, they have a lot of great stuff. It's the Adaptive Design Lab. <clears throat> and then there's another one called the Mod Lab, and that's out of uh, California. And they do a lot of great stuff not only with that, but also with like video games and gamification and, and some really interesting stuff around um, social justice work and digital humanities work. Um, and those are great places to go and check out. Um, but there, there's this question of, well, it's the beginning of the year, right? So I know high school uh, teachers that I'm working with here in Michigan, and they're two weeks into the school year, and they already have to do a mid-unit assessment uh, because they're halfway through, through a, a unit already. So how do you how do you balance this need for culture and this need for classroom identity and who fits where and being able to understand because that's really the only way that we understand variability is by embracing it mm -hmm. and actually identifying it and seeing it. How do we balance that with this this massive push that in two weeks I'm already at a I'm already halfway through a unit. How do we how do we do that? Does anybody you know that's a million dollar question I understand yeah. but any thoughts? Um, some of our high school teachers have used, um, you know, Google Forms and things like that to learn about the students um, individually because you'll have students that will tell them things about themselves that they might not otherwise say out loud. Um, so they just they just look for, like, try to meet the kids in their interests and where they are and find um, ways to interact with them, you know, on their, at their level and their yeah, interests. Um, and I think it really is one of those million dollar questions, Brian, because that pressure for academic success quickly, immediately, measurable now, is rather than a, a, an emphasis on growth, something that we can see uh, each individual making progress through I, I, it's it's difficult to change the the political climate of of the testing and da data and I think data can be important but we are looking at it in ways sometimes that are 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 far removed from the individuals that that data is coming from and I guess that's why teachers are so amazing because in spite of that they are still finding ways to uh, build relationships. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have an exam coming up. It's going to be important. I'm going to find ways to help you be successful. And uh, I, I see a lot of, it, it's the, the best examples that I see sometimes are those really, it, it, it's just being very explicit with, with constant, it's kind of a language thing. I think I think that that my question about how do our words reflect that, and when I see teachers just every word out of their mouth sort of, you know, kind of involves that 
honoring of their students and the challenges and risks and failures and effort and persistence and and I think that uh, watching what we say could be a very good way to start the school year in terms of creating that environment um, and and then also I think listening that's one of the things that keeps coming up in my my world is how do we how do we create more opportunities to listen to our students and to let them um, have that voice but also as experts and content experts and, and, and encouraging them to become um, the the voice in the classroom as learners and I like digital tools that allow 100% participation but then also have this transparency mm -hmm. in peer learning where students are responding to each other Mm -hmm. um, but it takes a lot of scaffolding too. But I think when we talk uh, with these questions of how can we um, change environment and how do we, uh, at the beginning of the year, build um, y you know non-traditional spaces? Those digital spaces can be very non-traditional too. But they take we have to we have to. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, stems, kind of word stems and phrases that help students to know how to respond appropriately to each other so that they can also continue that um, conversation in, in healthy ways with each other in those spaces. So as we're uh, nearing our last 10 minutes and, and um, before we have to, we're going to do some plugging and, and, and some other things. Um, Kit, in your opinion and, and everybody else, please weigh in as well, and, and people out on Twitter, uh, please weigh in as well. Um, so this, this is a daunting task, right? So I have to design my environment, I have to design my, my lessons and my learning, which in and of itself is a huge, is a huge test. But then um, I also have to try and build the culture. Um, is, there, is there a practical way for me to do that? Like is there a, where do I start, right? Let's just get down to brass tacks. Where do I start? Where do I begin? Do I begin with it all? Because if I'm a new teacher, beginning with it all, or even if I am a seasoned veteran wise teacher trying to make a huge shift um, to a UDL mentality or to a mentality of, of fostering variability and designing for variability, in either case, it's, it's a strong, it's a, it's a huge undertaking. So where, where, where should I start? Well, I'm just going to jump down a couple slides and I'll have to put the, uh, the link to this so that people can click on them. I'm just going to, um, two, I had three things that I kind of pulled in as, as resources that I've been interested in that maybe are, are, are practical places for that. This, the second one, learning about your students through seating chart challenges really resonated with me this year as some very practical pieces of how you can get to know your students um, through challenges that are part of whatever content you're teaching, um, but create cooperative learning um, opportunities, true cooperative learning that has that positive interdependence and individual accountability. So I thought this article was very practical in that sort of beginning of year ways to, and even at a semester change or any kind of time when we transition students to new environments. Um, the other is this creating space for risk, uh, especially for an elementary environment. Uh, Michael Thornton is someone I've admired. I, I'm going to butcher the name of the school district. It's Mar Marble County School District. It's in Virginia. A lot of people are probably familiar with some of their work. This was an Edutopia article. Uh, I'll just pull it up here for a second. We'll see if it loads. Um, but I think uh, this is an interesting article because in part that district has really done some things physically with their spaces. I'll see if they show it. There's, I, don't, I know there were some photos. Or I believe there were some photos in here. Nope. This one he's just talking about it. Pardon me. Here we go. Uh, where you, you know, part of it is, is having uh, that physical space, but what Michael really kind of speaks to is some of the ways that they are um, using the 
strategies at the beginning of the year to get students to take risks, to be taking ownership over their learning. So I, I share those two uh, links as as practical resources, and I'll I'll show, throw those into the chat. I appreciate that. Yeah, we'll um, um, we'll put them up in the chat, and then uh, we'll also put them um, in the archive, um, and we'll add them to the um, add them to the Storify that we're going to post up in, in the UDL IRN uh, website. Um, so th those are some great resources. Um, Kim uh, 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 at Coy underscore Kimberly. Um, makes a great statement out on Twitter. She says, first step in, uh, the first step is to create or start the culture you are looking for, right? And uh, um, I guess I think that that's, uh, that's kind of where everybody's, what everybody's been saying, um, and that your space will come. You know, you start to put your space together too, but really this, this idea of, of starting with your culture and building your culture. Um, I don't know, what do you think of, out there in uh, Wisconsin, Kim? Oh, <clears throat> I would agree. Some of the uh, resources like we did for our pilot this summer too, um, entering the school year, we did look at, you know, some of the growth mindset uh, language and those kinds of things to, to build into our everyday. Um, and it does tie in very well with the affective network. Um, and Dr. Rose would even say teaching, you know, is emotional work. And so I really, I'm a firm believer that when you um, build those relationships with students and and really give them a comfortable, safe place to learn that the rest will come, you know, will come. But I do really firmly believe that, you know, um, at the heart of, you know, of all we know about the brain is that affective network. And it's really important to uh, tie that social emotional piece to build that culture for learning. I think it's crucial. It's, it's so interesting that you said that, Kim, because just as you were saying that, um, <clears throat> Uh, at uh, Princess Unicorn uh, or Casey Overstreet, she says, um, uh, "Build up the UDL culture you want by breaking down the affective filter." And so I think that's as that was out on Twitter. Um, so I think that that's just such a great tie between the two um, of what you're talking about. Um, is re and really, teaching is emotional work, right? And that's that's why mm -hmm. we do it, right? And it's passionate work, and it has to be passion-driven work. Um, and I think it's so, what, what you both are saying is that it's not just passion work from our side, from our teaching side, it's passion work from what our students do as well. And Absolutely. as we build students who are passionate about their learning and passionate about the design of their own learning, mm -hmm. then we start, th we start that cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, to me, that's, that's a, a brilliant, brilliant statement that you both are making. And so, um, let's see, uh, Kit posted up over on Twitter, uh, if you're following UDLIRN, uh, so it'll be in the Storyfy as well, uh, his links to his presentation. Um, and just, you know what, Kit, there's some great pictures in there, man. That's what I love about your presentation yeah, when I was looking at it. I was real jealous. I'm like, man, that, that guy's put in some good work, um, and I, he's just got some amazing artifacts that are being created from that. Um, Kit, I also know that you're you're pretty big in the uh, the maker space movement, uh, as well as uh, different maker fairs and things like that. Um, how do you see those things connecting to uh, UDL? I guess that that was one place that I was going to maybe go to in terms of where the where's that potentiality that's sort of on the fringe of our schools that we could maybe be informed by. And so I I've been involved in a robotics program at the high school level and then um, building some coding clubs and maker type spaces um, at the elementary level and I guess what I'm seeing in those environments are that by uh, part of it is is space and 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 what is actually there the the tangible elements of learning things that we can create with and design with and express our learning with and um, the maker movement's interesting because you have this sort of convergence of uh, digital and analog, where we can use you know paper and glue and uh, Arduino boards and and LED lights and and suddenly the craft 
has become connected and in because of social media and YouTube and sharing it can become something that uh, others learn along with us or we learn from them and there's this very dynamic um, sort of interplays between learner and teacher in those environments so in the robotics there are these mentors who are the adults who are the experts and yet the learning is really driven by the students and the design challenge and I think maker spaces also explore that as well and so um, the only uh, and the other piece of that that I found really interesting is that w who we consider traditionally the the best learners in these spaces uh, there's there seems to be so many more pathways and avenues for mm -hmm. everyone to have success as learners in there and that uh, our robotics team attracted a, the, a very diverse group of learners um, that in a traditional classroom might be uh, almost sort of uh, shunned or, or or fear you know oh I've got these students who represent this to me and that I have concerns about my ability to support but in in the in the maker space or in the robotics it's just they're just part of the team and just part of we're all part of working together so I've been inspired by that I love that uh, I love I love that story man and I, I love that uh, the way that you talk about it um, you know that students are really working towards putting forth a project and how do we get around this thing and build this project and how do we really build what students are really building are, are really complex and really well-defined skill teams where everything is being honored from the students uh, what, as to what piece they can bring and that to me is is the ultimate in in designing for accessibility right you know you don't have to be great at everything but what you're really great at is, is absolutely something that makes the whole a better piece um, so we, we are coming close on our last five minutes, and um, so I just want to throw it out there for any final thoughts that uh, anybody may have, and then, um, you know, if you got a plug, please put it in, um, and then uh, I'll come back and I'll plug some other stuff. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm, I'm going to throw it back out to you. Any final thoughts? No, no, no final thoughts. Okay. okay. No. <laughs> I'll just say thank you. I really enjoyed being a part of the um, hangout tonight, and um, I've learned as much as I hopefully have contributed. So I appreciate this opportunity. I I know I I've I've said a lot already, so maybe I was trying to kind of uh, not uh, completely hog the the airwaves here, but um, what Kimberly just said too about learning from each other in hearing your responses and your questions and and even what gets put into the chat it's it's this ongoing process for us to, as a community I, I get excited by what UDL chat has done in terms of giving um, those of us who are passionate about still learning about UDL a, a place to continuously come back and and sharpen the saw and and to do a webinar like this and to learn from each other um, I, again another opportunity to sharpen the saw I don't come to this being an expert in any way um, I, 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 I've been blessed to have some really interesting experiences that have informed why I'm passionate about universal design for learning or even just good learning and like fun learning that joyful learning I, I really want to have that for my own children and for um, all the students that I have the opportunity to work with and so where can I um, find more good ways to f to to facilitate joyful learning and uh, I think that um, the work that folks like this group are doing is is one of my clearest avenues to that so thank you so much for for bringing this together and doing the good work that everybody's doing well, I, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share out real quick. Uh, do the final plugs because uh, UDL chat is just around the corner, and we want to make sure that we give people time to uh, hop in their virtual uh, vehicles and get over there. Um, so, <clears throat> just very quickly, again, keep this conversation rolling, folks. Uh, with with the hashtag UDLIRN, 
um, and you can combine that with UDL chat, um, and you can create a powerful force. And uh, we're going to start building must must UDL Twitter um, very soon. So uh, you can you can uh, hook up with. Oops, sorry. You can catch the uh, the archive of this on both the UDL IRN website, which is UDL IR, uh, UDL slash IRN uh, dot org. Just type it in; it'll come up. Um, and you can find us on Google Plus, uh, same name. Um, and you can find it on the YouTube channel. You can watch it here again. Also, got to make a big plug for the 2016 UDL IRN Summit coming up March 16th and 17th. Please make sure the pre-conference is March 15th, 2016. Townsend University, it is the place to be in March. Uh, all things UDL and all things amazing will be happening from there. Uh, so come together. Uh, the summit is about bringing practitioners and bringing researchers and bringing all facets of UDL together and making just a nice uh, UEL stew that is delicious. <laughs> and then my final plug uh, before before we sign off here, uh, don't forget to join us in UDL chat just uh, after the hangout uh, in a matter of two minutes. Um, Ron will be uh, Ron had to drop out so that he could go start fire up the engines and bring the atomic batteries to speed. Um, I'll be joining him over there. We'll both be uh, uh, moderating it. And remember, UDL chat, chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. UDL IRN Hangout, this is our Wednesday. This is our, our first Wednesday. Um, and then we will be doing it every third Thursday from here on out. Next uh, next time we're doing some, uh, we're talking with folks from research, uh, talking about some of the UDL research and what it may entail. Um, I am saying, uh, that's one that you're going to want to check out for sure. Um, so <clears throat> with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I want to thank all of my great participants, uh, Eric Moore, Ron Rogers, uh, Kim. I don't want to slaughter your last name, so I'll let you throw that part in yourself. Um, and, and of course, uh, my man Kit Hard, uh, the UDL evangelist himself, uh, great, great head of hair. Uh, fantastic, <laughs> nice, beautiful words. Uh, so thank you guys so much for joining and putting up with me, um, and, uh, and and dropping some knowledge bombs. Thank I you. I hope to talk to you guys again. Kit, I will see you over in UDL chat, brother. I'm on my okay. way. Okay. All right. I'll turn off the lights. Awesome. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Bye. Thank you.